Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. The following podcast on apartheid, race, and South Africa and the providence of God is going to be a very detailed and graphic description of, of race and persecution and violence. And so we wanted to let you know that before uh, we ran it because we want you to be able to have the choice to choose uh, not to listen. On the other hand, if you'll hang in with us, we think you're in for a very interesting look at the way in which people can treat one another in destructive ways and the way in which God can step in to that destructiveness. Welcome to the table. We discuss issues of God and culture. And my guest today is Neil Henry, who has come to us all the way from Cape Town in South Africa. So he's had a long swim. <laughs> uh, and Neil is a pastor in Lavender Hill, which is a part of a suburb and township in, in Cape Town. Is that right? That's correct, absolutely. And how long have you been a pastor at the church there? I'm um, at this church for seven years, Okay, um, but been in pastoral ministry for, for over 20 years. Okay. Yeah. And you're on, on staff as well at the Bible Institute of South Africa, That's right? correct. I'm responsible for the Christian Leadership Program. It's mm -hmm. a program that trains pastors and church leaders from the greater Cape Flats community, which is the larger part of, of our community. Okay. And the Cape Flats Flats are part of the poorest parts of South Africa, correct? That's right. The Cape Flats were developed because of the Group Areas Act. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the apartheid laws that were instituted in the early 1960s. Okay. So our topic is uh, is race and apartheid in South Africa, and kind of where South Africa is today, viewed through a Christian lens. And so uh, I've brought Neil in. We were uh, this summer. I spent some time in. South Africa, and Neil was part of the program that I was put on, and I got to hear his testimony, and that's what we're going to be sharing with you today as you get a glimpse of a completely different cultural experience on race that I also think has some interesting insights for us as, as Christians. So Neil, we'll just dive into the story if we can. Tell us a little bit about your family background, and um, as you do that, tell us briefly about the ethnic mix that your family is, and I've got to go through some terminology first. Um, in South Africa, the term colored is a technical racial term for people of mixed racial background. That's right. And it's distinguished from black, which is someone who is, I take it, completely racially black, at least as best as the person knows. And the indigenous people of Africa. And the indigenous people yeah. of Africa as well. So so these are terms that are going to be common. Some of what I'm going to have to do during this is is to translate Neil South African <laughs> English into American English so that we can we can follow the story and not get lost. So um, so with that as the introduction, tell us a little bit about your family background and how how apartheid worked in your life. Right, just very briefly, maybe let's begin with just my ethnic mix. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to track our family tree uh, just back two generations. Mm -hmm. um, can't do much more than that. On my mom's side, we have a mix of Irish um, mercenary mm -hmm. with a um, young slave girl that was exiled on St. Helena Island. Okay. Um, and then on my dad's side, the mix would be um, French, Huguenot, Dutch, ostrich farmer mm -hmm. that came from Europe, mm -hmm. um, together with a Khoisan slave woman that was part of the, the indigenous people that had been in, emancipated. So, so this is European Mal Malays, case uh, on which is what? Khoisan? Khoisan? In, the, in the old terms, they would have been spoken about as the, they were the indigen indigenous Hottentot and Bushman people. Okay. Yeah. All right, so you've got you've got the full mix basically. It's all there. So you're 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 colored in 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 technicolor almost. In many ways. Yeah. yeah. I think we probably the rainbow nation all wrapped up in one. <laughs> oh wow, okay. So so talk about your family background and how uh, how apartheid affected your life when you were growing up. I was born in the 1950s, 1959, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. made it into into that decade. Mm -hmm. um, and that had obviously been the start of of white nationalism where the white national Party had developed apartheid laws that were then instituted. Uh, my family, uh, we, I was born in a town called Benoni, mm -hmm. in a little township called Actonville. Mm -hmm. 
um, one of six brothers, and uh, our family were displaced in 1963 by the Group Areas Act. Um, Actonville had been declared a, an Indian area, and we were then moved to a new township. Mm-hmm. Uh, families that had the means um, were able to move into a new township called Bossment. Mm-hmm. That was a completely new development for colored people and mm-hmm. sort of became a, a middle-class colored community. Okay. Um, and those who didn't have the means would move into council houses mm-hmm. um, that the government had provided. Um, my dad was a school teacher, mm-hmm. and so he qualified for a subsidy. Uh, a housing subsidy, and so we had a fairly comfortable home. For the next number of years of my life, we had a. I grew up in a in a primary school that was uh, in a coloured community, mm-hmm. um, but but reasonably reasonably well sourced. Mm-hmm. Um, high school much the same, and uh, but but the area was racially segregated, mm-hmm. and uh, so we had a new railway station, but there were two sections to the station. Mm-hmm. We had a white section and a non-white section, mm-hmm. and we were never allowed to use the white section of the station. Mm-hmm. Um, there were facilities nearby. There was a post office that was segregated, and we would have to use the non-white section of the of the post office. Mm-hmm. And all amenities had been segregated. So those early apartheid rules, several of them, um, Group Areas Act, um, Mixed Marriages Act, the government had prohibited the marriage of people of color with with white people. Um, and then when 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 people of color and and white people live together, they then passed a law called the Immorality Act. Hmm. So it outlawed any kind of relationship across the color boundary. Hmm. There was a race classification register we brought, which brought about the those designations: white, Indian, colored, and 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 black or Bantu mm-hmm. was the term used back then. And your identity document would carry that kind of classification as well. Mm. People of color had to carry a special document called a passbook. Mm-hmm. And that passbook was your document to be able to move out of your designated area into areas that were occupied by white folks. Mm. Other laws included um, the Suppression of Terrorism Act. Mm-hmm. It was a law to help protect the Nationalist Party government against any kind of um, anti apartheid protests or action against them. Um, the Separate Development Act, which, uh, uh, Job Reservation Act, these were all laws that entrenched um, the separate development of, of white people from, from people of color. Okay, so that's the world that you lived in. So let's talk about your experience. You go to college. You, you, up to this point, you're just living a normal South African life, right? Yeah, fairly, fairly comfortable. Yeah. Um, we, went, we went wealthy, mm-hmm. um, and my dad was one of those – Reasonable civil servants. Mm-hmm. Um, you obeyed the laws of government. Mm-hmm. You didn't shake your fist in the face of those in authority. Mm-hmm. But he would inculcate values of, of integrity and honesty and hard work, um, uh, loyalty. Those are things that he inculcated in us. And so for all of my years, all right up to my matric year, um, mm-hmm. my, my finishing up high school, yeah. that's right, um, fairly, fairly oblivious of, of any, any, any problems in the country, even though we lived, lived segregated lives. Mm-hmm. The first that I became conscientized to that was probably late 1975 mm-hmm. with the death of Steve Beaker. Mm-hmm. He was a black consciousness activist. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he died at the hands of the security police uh, in 75. He was badly beaten up. He died, and, and that hit the press. Mm-hmm. And uh, as school kids, I was then in my grade, my grade 11 year, mm-hmm. for the first time started questioning what this was about. The following year, we had the outbreak of the June 76 riots. Mm-hmm. Um, school kids in Soweto rose up against, um, against the government. They didn't, arrange, didn't tell their parents, but a mass protest took place in Soweto. Mm-hmm. And kids marched from every corner of the township mm. um, towards a local police station. And they were really protesting the, the substandard education system. They were protesting the use of Afrikaans as a medium of instruction. Mm-hmm. Bear in mind, Afrikaans... Um, at that stage, was regarded as the language of the oppressor. Okay. And had it been made the official language of the country, I think back in the 1930s, okay. by, by this Nationalist Party government. Um, and then, of course, these in, in the black schools, kids were also made to learn Afrikaans as a, as a language. So the, being the indigenous languages um, when, was not their first language. Afrikaans mm. was made to be a first language. And then behind it all, there was also the protest and calling for the police, uh, for the release of political prisoners. At that stage, 
all political organizations, anti-apartheid organizations have been banned. Leaders were imprisoned uh, on Robben Island, in Pretoria and elsewhere. And, um, and, and many others had been driven into exile. So that was, that was the climate in, in 1976. And the, the, uh, the thing that we would do was to avoid getting signed up in military training because then I'd have to sign up as a colored person to join mm-hmm. what was called the Cape Corps. Mm-hmm. It was a, a colored division of the South African Defense Force. There was no way I could go and fight a war and defend the borders of the country for a nationalist government. Mm-hmm. So I'd applied and went to university. Uh, university of the Witwatersrand was one of two universities that would take students of color, and we'd have to apply for special ministerial consent from the Minister of the Interior to mm-hmm. be able to go. Um, and they only took a certain number. And But those are two universities that would take us. And so I went and I enrolled, I started studying law, got involved, uh, arrived on the campus, and suddenly you discover that you're now in an environment where where students are highly politically conscientized. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd wandered into a, a mass meeting um, where students had been protesting, the black students had been protesting uh, the, the arrest under the terrorism laws of a number of their leaders. Um, there was mass pandemonium. And I opened my mouth. I suggested a a, a, a sit-in, mm-hmm. a protest of classes, a boycott of classes, a march to demand their release, um, send a telegram to the prime minister of the country. Um, went up to Charleston Street Post Office with this march and then promptly got arrested for the first time mm-hmm. um, by the security police. Um, there was a law that had been instituted under the Terrorism Act, the Suppression of Terrorism Act, called the Internal Security Act. It was sort of a subsection of a law, and they called it Section 22. It was notorious, Mm -hmm. because with this law, you could be incarcerated without being charged, um, without the rights to receive bail, um, without appearing in a court, um, without the rights to to representation, legal representation, no visitation rights. Um, no district surgeon, mm-hmm. and you'd be tossed into a cell for as long as the police would want to interrogate you. The police organization back then was known as the Bureau of State Security, BOSS, mm-hmm. very appropriately, the boss. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the first of several incarcerations that, I, that I'd endured. Over a period of two and a half years, um, I'd never been sentenced in a court of law, mm-hmm. but I'd had several times that I'd been picked up, um, beaten, interrogated um, for various for various bits of information, and spent a fair amount of time in a number of different police cells. Um, amongst them, uh, the notorious John Foster Square. Uh, in our news at the moment, there's the story of Ahmad Timol, mm-hmm. whose case is, he was, he, 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 the police reported that he'd committed suicide, he jumped from the 10th floor of the building. Um, he'd obviously been thrown, mm-hmm. as many others had, and so that case has come up in the courts at the moment. I'd been on in John Foster Square. I knew I knew the place. Um, Brixton Police Station was known as the workshop. Mm-hmm. That was the nickname for it, mm-hmm. and you could figure out why it was called workshop mm-hmm. because you certainly got a working over. I'd been in Krugersdorp Prison. It was on the outskirts of the city, and then the one that I remember most clearly was Mother B. Um, it was a small prison just outside Benoni. Um, the place where I'd actually grown up. Um, in total, over the period of, of a period of two and a half years, I'd had 182 days that I'd been in and out of police cells, hmm. varying periods. Sometimes for 14 days, sometimes uh, 28 days was was one long stint, and then the longest was a 52 day stint. Hmm. Others were shorter, maybe a weekend, three or four days. When you were arrested and taken to Mother B, it was obviously to interrogate you for information around the leadership of the of the movement. The movement, obviously, that I'd then become a part of was known as the Black Consciousness Movement. Mm-hmm. And this had flowed out of the Steve Biko era. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, in fact, one of the um, early, early propagators of the Black Consciousness Movement. And, and the so, Black Consciousness Movement was, uh, was a movement that just made people aware of race in general. It isn't just strictly blacks. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, in fact, anybody that 
it, it sort of it sort of pushed for a for a decolonization mm-hmm. um, of of the country mm-hmm. and for the return of assets to indigenous people. Okay, and and a, and and so Pan Africanism would have been a strong part of that. Mm-hmm. Um, there were some slogans that came out of it back then: um, "Kill the Boer, kill mm-hmm. the farmer." Mm-hmm. And uh, those are obviously very negatively perceived. And and at this point, you're not a believer, so you're just you're just going through life and have reacted to what's going on around you. This was just a reaction to my arriving on the campus. Mm-hmm. Um, I was not a Christian, and uh, though I'd grown up in a re- reasonably religious home, mm-hmm. um, but my exposure to the gospel was somewhat limited. Okay. Um, that really only came several years later, okay. and I'll maybe say something about that in a bit. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, particular imprisonment. Um, uh, this is the part of the story that I um, – that I particularly recall. Talk, um, talk about the the way in which interrogation was taking place and disorientation for the prisoner took place. There were probably several goals behind the imprisonment. One was to remove you from from association with the organization, and then, of course, to 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 break you down bit by bit that you no longer be a part of it. The levels of indignity um, are, are horrid to explain. Mm-hmm. But what would happen is you'd arrive at the prison. Um, you knew you were facing at least 14 days where you had absolutely no rights. Mm-hmm. Um, all your clothing would be taken away. You'd be stripped naked. Um, you'd be showered. And, uh, and, then, and then you'd have to endure the indignity of a cavity search. You'd then be issued with what you'd live with for the next couple of days. Um, a a grass mat, probably about the size of the stable, uh, that would lie on the floor, a felt mat that would lay on top of it, and then two gray blankets. We used to call them foul donkeys. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an Afrikaans word meaning uh, gray, gray donkeys. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that was because the texture of the blanket was very similar to the hair of a donkey, mm-hmm. very coarse. Mm-hmm. You'd also be given a bucket. And you could decide what you'd do with the bucket. Um, you could either fill it with water and use it for for drinking and, and freshening up, or you'd use it for your ablutions, and that would be rotated every 24 hours. Mm-hmm. You decided what you would do with it. Mm. Uh, you were placed into a cell. The building was very odd because it was built below the ground, and there were bars on the in- inside, but the walls really were just corrugated zinc all the way around. And the cells were nine by six. So you basically had space to lay your mattress down and a space almost the same size as the mattress alongside of it. Mm. Bare concrete. Um, the windows were at ground level. And so there would be a grill where the, where the glass would be. So it's actually above you. Hop, it's above you. It's yeah, high, yeah, it's high yeah. above, probably yeah. um, uh, about nine feet. Okay. It would be about nine feet above you. Mm-hmm. So you couldn't, you couldn't actually reach it. Mm-hmm. But you knew that those were the windows because they, sometimes there'd be a glimmer of light coming through it. But most times it was so cluttered with dirt from the outside because it was a ground level, mm-hmm. you couldn't tell. Mm-hmm. Single light in the center of the cell. Uh, sort of a pale yellow light, and you would, wouldn't really know if it was day or night. Mm-hmm. What they would do is they would begin to disorient you by feeding you three meals a day. Mm-hmm. You went on what they call spare diet, mm-hmm. and spare diet would include um, breakfast, lunch, and supper. Mm-hmm. The way that I knew the difference was breakfast always had it was all millipup. Mm-hmm. It's a sort of a grits porridge that we were that we were given. So you'd have millipup um, in the morning. And you knew that that was the morning meal because it had golden syrup with it. Mm -hmm. The lunch meal had a sort of a soup with it. Mm -hmm. Or you'd be given a drink called puza mandla. Mm -hmm. It was a sourish sourish drink that was loaded with protein. Mm. And then there was a third – the third meal would have a block of animal fat with it. And Mm. so you knew that was dinner. Mm -hmm. So you had breakfast, lunch, and and dinner, but – They'd bring it to you at odd hours. So you could receive breakfast at 6 in the morning, lunch at 8, and then your supper at 10 o'clock. And then you'd starve until the next time breakfast comes. And that could be at 5 o'clock the next morning. Hmm. And then it would be 5 and 7 and Mm 9. And then it would switch and go to 11 and 1 and 3. And so they would do that just to disorient you. And in between, you'd be fetched for interrogation. Hmm. So, so the process was to wear you down. Uh, y- you'd lose any sense of time. Um, in order to stay focused, um, and 
this was a government who, who believed that they were doing what was Christian, mm-hmm. and so they would give you a page of the Bible hmm. with your meal. Hmm. And they tear the whole Bible apart, and you'd get a page. But each day you'd get a different page. You could have a page from Habakkuk today, a Revelation tomorrow, and Ephesians the next day. Hmm. And that was very confusing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wasn't a Christian, so I'd read, but uh, yeah, just didn't have an idea as to, as what, to was what it was reading? about. That's yeah. right, yeah. uh-huh. So uh, now there's interrogation, and there's this process. We probably have time just to describe a little bit of the, of the beatings that also took place. There was physical, physical torture as well. One of the one of the things that we did was to produce leaflets, mm-hmm. um, and it would be go- anti-government propaganda, mm-hmm. and call for the boycott of um, white-dominated businesses, government installations, that type of thing. And so, in the in the interrogations, in the torture, they'd want you to release information around who the leaders were, um, where the leaflets were being printed, where the meetings were being held, who the speakers would be. And various means of torture we used, most commonly beatings um, with a fist, um, with a shambok. It was a a piece of leather, animal leather that had been dried, Mm. Um, with a whip aerial of a car, um, a wet towel, um, electric shock, um, electrodes attached to to the genitals and, and shock pass through the body, waterboarding. Very common, sack over the head, um, water poured over the face, and those were just some of the some of the cruel tortures that were that were applied. And the goal was to break you down emotionally, correct? Oh, emotionally and physically. Yeah, and physically. Yeah. And uh, and so this led you to um, to a state of depression, basically, and you thought a couple of times about taking your life. Oh no, absolutely, it is. Over a period of two and a half years, it, it had gotten to the point. Now, there were, there were a couple of things that, that led to, to, to my just being worn down. That was one of them. Uh, one, another was a visit. They had taken me to my mom's place, uh, trashed my mom's home, searching for a silk screen. Um, they didn't find it. I didn't know where it was, but they, they trashed my, my mom's home. I wasn't staying at home. She cut my shirt off because they wouldn't take the handcuffs off and uh, dab my body with a dental with an antiseptic bath in order to get rid of some of the flea bites that I'd had on, 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 on the skin. They allowed her to dress me. She put some antiseptic cream on my upper torso and then she made a drink of glucose and honey in milk. Mm-hmm. And when she tried to help me drink it because I couldn't hold it with the, with the handcuffs on, the, uh, the policeman, the security policeman had come, slapped it out of my hand. It smashed against the wall, and for the first time in that entire ordeal, I saw my mom weep, mm. and that was hard. Mm-hmm. I actually determined I didn't want to put my family through that. Mm-hmm. A couple of other things, the police would often bring Polaroid photographs of mm-hmm. what the students were doing while we were languishing in the cells. Mm-hmm. And I think, unfortunately, with a mob, you find that, that when your leaders are gone, the guys go partying, yeah. and that would be brandished in your face. Okay. Um, and then I had a number of friends who had disappeared, mm-hmm. um, just disappeared, never heard from again. Fi- their bodies were found in the bush, shot, buried. Sometimes you never hear of them. And a very dear friend of mine had, had been killed by the security police, and that negatively affected me as well. So slid into a pit of depression. And for four years, um, after a, for three years after I, I'd left the university, uh, just, just floundered around with that depression. Probably the most painful part of the story is what you just told, which is the time when there was uh, when your mom had to go through um, an an exchange with the uh, with the police uh, as they had you a- incarcerated. And on the other end of that, you became very depressed and and got on the edge of suicide. And I'm fascinated by what prevented you from killing yourself. Yeah, between 1980 and 1984, a very angry young man, bitter, um, filled with hatred, um, just hated white people and everything that they stood for, and particularly the policeman that had been responsible for some of those incarcerations, his face would come to mind often, Hmm. and it drove me to the brink of suicide, and I decided the best way to go would be to smash my motorcycle into a concrete wall. And so I got onto my bike one day, um, had a big super bike, uh, loosened the strap of the helmet, and then my eyes welled up with tears as I prepared to smash my bike. And I suddenly had an image in my head of a, 
of a jam donut hmm. and a and a can of stony ginger beer. It's a soda that we have. Hmm. The stony was ice cold with the with the dew running down the outside, and this jam donut is golden brown with a hmm. crystal white sugar You're and the apricot jam just oozing out yeah, the side. Yeah. And that image was so powerful that it made me turn around and go and ha- shoplift. Hmm. A jam donut and a stony, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I went back to my room and uh, and slept on the carpet because I'd got rid of everything, mm-hmm. in, everything thinking I I was going to die mm-hmm. and planning to, to kill myself. And then and then the next morning I'd work and the depression was back. Mm. And I went and wanted to do the same thing. And for the second day I got that image, and that stopped me from doing that. Um, I went from job to job during that period. Um, and and every job I'd either lost it um, or I walked out in anger after striking somebody and normally the white boss. Mm-hmm. By 1984, um, just couldn't couldn't handle it any longer. Met a friend who had come from Cape Town and decided I'm going to go to Cape Town to turn over a new leaf. Hmm. And so I hiked to Cape Town hmm. with two rand thirty seven cents in my pocket. Hmm. Left all my belongings behind. Uh, said to my mom, I'm leaving, I'm going to start a new life. I hiked to Cape Town, and I promptly landed in the home of a Christian family. In so a just to explain, two rand is the rand is the like the South African equivalent of currency. It's the, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So you did. So that would be that would be about uh, well twenty cents. US. Twenty cents. Okay, yeah, all twenty right. cents US. In your pocket. Wow. Yeah. The I hiked. I went to this family in a township called Mitchell's Plain. It's a large colored township mm-hmm. um, that was developed um, under the Group Areas Act. The family I went to were they were a believing family. I didn't know that. I was friends with their sons in Johannesburg, mm. and these boys were living a riotous life. They mm. were my friends, uh-huh. and they said, "Go and tell our folks that we that we're okay," which I did. Um, they knew that I was lying. Mm-hmm. Uh, they then invited me to stay with them, opened their home to me. This was odd. Um, they took a stranger in off the street mm-hmm. who came and lied to them. Mm-hmm. And this mom went down the corridor after we had dinner, and she prayed for her sons. And I realized she didn't believe me. Mm-hmm. And then she prayed for this new son that the Lord had sent into her life. Mm. And uh, her prayer said, please rescue him before he perishes in hell. Mm. And I was confronted with the reality of the lostness of my state at mm. that point. Mm. This family shared the gospel with me. I came to faith a week later, and I then lived with them for six months. Mm. And that began the, the first days of my Christian life. Mm. I met my wife that very year. They took me to a youth camp. And uh, we met. She was a Cape Townian girl. Um, we'd, um, a year later, 1986, we got married. Mm-hmm. And then we worked with an interdenominational outreach group called Mission to Youth for a number of years. Mm-hmm. And it was really just uh, visiting folks in, in various communities, sharing the gospel, door-to-door campaigns, uh, open-air services, track drives. And uh, we, we went down to a town called George. Um, it's, a, it's, it's outside the Cape, um, about 300 kilometers, and visited a hospital in a colored township um, that was for terminally ill patients. Hmm. And the idea was to visit the beds of these patients, read scripture, pray with them. And uh, we sort of split up into, it's a whole team of us, so we split up into ones and twos. And we went from bed to bed. And I so it's a compassion ministry, basically. It is a compassion ministry yeah. and evangelistic. Mm-hmm. We worked with a local church in mm-hmm. the area. And so we were at this hospital, and uh, I tumbled onto the bed of a man, and immediately I recognized him. Hmm. And there was this policeman, this colonel, who I'd hated so much. Hmm. Now, I remember I'd been a Christian at this stage. This was about 1989, and uh, I'd been a Christian for five years. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, all of the anger and the bitterness, the resentment, um, the hatred, it all welled up again. Hmm. And when I'd seen him, I just wanted to tell him how much I hated him. Hmm. I wanted to say to him how much I was glad that he's not, and he was dying of emphysema. Hmm. So he was lying on this bed, filthy hospital, 
Um, he colored was, hospital. So colored hospital. A white a white policeman in a colored hospital. This was quite ironic yeah, because yeah. he was a a senior policeman mm-hmm. in the South African police force. Mm. And what had happened was between nineteen. 19- 80, 83, 84, and 1989, a part of it was being dismantled. Mm-hmm. The writing was on the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, sanctions, international pressure um, were taking its toll, internal pressure from a number of anti apartheid organizations, though they were banned. But the state, the country was in a state of emergency, and, and the government knew that. That, that things would fall apart soon. And they started to put out to seed a lot of the old guard that would have embarrassed the whole transition process. Mm. And he was one that was put out. He was put out with a package, but somehow his own family had estranged themselves from him. So he was all and, alone. And he was all alone. Yeah. And he ended up in a colored hospital. A man who had persecuted people of color for many years mm-hmm. was now dying in a colored hospital being cared for by people that he previously persecuted. Mm. I just thought it was very ironic. I thought about it afterwards and thought, how strange that the people that he would have had thrown in prison and beaten and, and tortured are the very people that cared for him when he died. Mm. Well, there he was. I, I took him by his hand and shook him fairly violently because I... I all that anger just spilled out. And I asked him if he remembered me. I asked him in Afrikaans. And uh, he sort of shrugged his shoulders. And that upset me that he couldn't even remember who I was. Mm-hmm. And so I shook him again. And I gave him the nickname that he'd given me. Mm-hmm. And the moment I said the nickname, he, he acknowledged. He then put his hand on mine. And with tears rolling down his face, he looked at me. And in Afrikaans, he said to me, Sir, would would you please forgive me? Hmm. Of course, I was shattered. Mm-hmm. I fell apart. I, I I broke down. I was weeping. Uh, he was weeping, and the the crew came along. What mm-hmm. and they wanted to know what's happening here. And so, and so my wife came, and she she'd sort of figured out this had something to do with something back the in the past. past. Yeah. And it wasn't detail that I'd bothered to share with her. It didn't seem that important. This, I mean, I'd become a Christian. I dealt with this. I'd moved on. And so this was in the past. And all she said to the others was, go away. I'll deal with this. And she opened her Bible, and and the, she just began to read Philippians 4. I plead with you, Santaiki and Euodia, to be at peace with one another. And she just read the whole account of Paul helping these folks who were in conflict. And... And then she read, Rejoice in the Lord always. And the, and the one thing that was gone was any sense of joy. Mm-hmm. I'd never felt more miserable at that time. Mm. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice, for the Lord is near. Mm-hmm. And I'd not, five years I've been reading the Bible, mm-hmm. I'd not clearly heard that line. Mm-hmm. The Lord is near. Um, be anxious about nothing in everything by prayer and supplication. Make your request known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding. And she read the entire passage and went back and read it again. Mm-hmm. And again, I heard that line, the Lord is near. And it suddenly struck me that the Lord could be standing in the doorway of this ward, wanting to step into our lives. And yet I am in a shattered relationship with a man and angry and bitter with him and knowing how much I'd been forgiven, and I couldn't find it in my heart to actually express forgiveness to this man. Hmm. I broke down and wept. Um, I stepped outside into the into a little courtyard, and and Trish prayed. We'd left there a couple of days later. We traveled home, and it bothered me for two weeks. I just wanted to be with this man. I wanted to go and see him. Mm-hmm. I realized he was alone and destitute. Mm-hmm. And, and Trish agreed that we go back and visit. And when we got back there, he'd passed away. Mm. And because his family hadn't come to claim his body, he was given a pauper's burial during that week that we were there. And Trish and I stood at that open grave site. Um, tractor came, dug a big hole. They put all these bodies in there. The state brought these bodies, laid them in there. The tractor closed the hole. A, a priest had sprinkled some holy water over the site. Not a prayer was prayed, not a hymn was sung, not a scripture was read, not a word of obituary was given. Just absolutely no dignity whatsoever, and and he was buried that way. I chatted with the nurses afterwards, and it was very interesting that that these nurses had no idea that this was that policeman hmm. that had such a notorious reputation. Hmm. Because in the time that he was in the hospital, hmm. they could not understand. This was just a sweet old man hmm. that was suffering and whose family had rejected him. Hmm. And uh, I have no doubt that the Lord must have done a work in his life. But that moment was 
was absolutely necessary for me. Providentially, the Lord gave me that so that so that I could confront just some of the issues that I'd been grappling with. Mm-hmm. And even though I'd been a Christian for so long, um, they were just pent up issues that I'd never dealt with. A lot of that was sitting inside of me. And that moment really just cut the skin and revealed what needed to, to be revealed in my own heart. Wonderful moment, I think, that I've treasured because I think without that, I'd I'd probably still be grappling with bitterness. Hmm. Um, it dealt. It dealt with a lot of the bitterness that I had. It dealt with my attitudes towards people of that that were fairer skinned. Mm-hmm. Um, it dealt with my insecurities, where I'd thought of others as more superior than myself, and that I'd been underprivileged and disadvantaged because of my skin color. Hmm. And interestingly, um, ye- several years later. Um, the church that I ended up pastoring down in our community was was a largely white church. Hmm. And many of those, that very experience just gave me the opportunity to be able to deal deal with that ministry more effectively. You actually ended up ministering to a lot of people who held the attitudes that were like the policeman who had beaten you up, correct? Uh, dozens. In fact, right up until last week, mm-hmm. um, we I spoke at a conference. I'm part of ACBC Africa, mm-hmm. um, Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, and our conference was on race mm. and racism. Mm. And um, and an elderly gentleman came to me after the conference, uh, spoke Afrikaans. He was a former policeman, mm. and he embraced me, uh, thanked me for sharing some of this testimony. Mm-hmm. And just said to me, uh, with, a, with a gnarled, authentic finger pointed at me and said to me, uh, in Afrikaans, you're my brother and I love you. Hmm. So I've had a wonderful opportunity over the years to minister to folks who, who have been in, in that situation. And, and from both sides of the line. Um, I mean, these days, remember, we have a generation of younger people growing up that, that don't, can't make this connection mm-hmm. with the past. Mm-hmm. These are events that happened in history. Right. And the way that these two books have been written has always been slanted. Right. And so this has been an opportunity to be able to share some of these things and help this generation connect the dots of history, hmm. that these were real events, that they really took place, and there were people that were affected mm-hmm. and are still affected today. The thing that strikes me about your story, and, and when I was asked to comment this when you gave the original testimony in South Africa, because that's what I was asked to do, uh, I said to you, it's, it's hard to believe, but it's important to remember that people are capable of doing this to one another. And that, uh, and yet, on the other hand, that 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 God is so at work in the way your particular story has unfolded. Um, so there's a lot to learn here. You now teach at the Bible Institute of South Africa, and you minister, interestingly enough, in a community known as Lavender Hill. And this, <laughs> you uh, you manage to to live a life that that is amazing. This is actually one of the more dangerous places in 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 Cape Town. If I can make an analogy, ties to the United States, this would be like ministering in the most violent parts of South uh, Chicago. And uh, there are murders that literally take place uh, across the street from your church. There's gang activity, et cetera. Talk about a little bit about uh, what your the people in your church have to live with and through. We came, we came to Lavendil Church uh, six years ago, and the reason for that was I wanted to be closer to the community um, that represents um, the, uh, that, that the pastors that we're training in our Christian leadership program at the Bible Institute, they come from similar communities, and I felt I wanted to be at the coalface. In, in, in 30 years of ministry, I don't think anything had prepared us for what we in, uh, encountered at Lavendale. Mm-hmm. Um, it is probably one of the most violent townships of the of Cape Town, probably the Western Cape and even the country. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw some stats the other day that we have on average in the Western Cape nine deaths a week mm. um, that are gang-related. Mm. I made a comment the other day that I'm beginning to think that our new evangelistic strategy is funerals. Hmm. And I could easily end up doing a funeral a week, sometimes more. Hmm. And it's normally violent death, young people between the age of 15 and, and 35. Hmm. For folks in our community, they live with, with poverty, unemployment. Um, and obviously, where there's poverty and unemployment, uh, there's crime, uh, there's theft, muggings. Um, and, and then, of course, gangsterism, which brings drugs and, and prostitution and, and dis- dysfunctional families with high levels of, of child abuse and neglect. A lot of single-parent families, um, teenage pregnancies, 
um, what's what's absolutely abnormal has become has become normal life in a community like that. Gunshots are every day. We're currently in a what we're calling a ceasefire. Hmm. Uh, there seems to have been some peace made between the gangs, and there hasn't been an outbreak of shooting for almost two weeks. Hmm. But you, during your visit there, um, yeah. you remember that yeah. there was there was shooting. We cancelled a midweek Bible study mm-hmm. because shooting was very close to the church. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard shooting. I've heard gunshots while while I'm preaching. Mm-hmm. Um, we labour through services. There was a period where our, our numbers dropped almost by 40% mm. because folks just cannot walk through these these areas on a Sunday morning mm-hmm. to be able to get to church. Mm. Pardon me. The, um, I find that, that the focus of a lot of what we have to do is is just uh, helping folks instill, just instill hope. Folks do despair. We have families who have become accustomed to sleeping on the floor mm. because when the gunshots ring out, they all drop off their beds mm-hmm. and bullets would be flying wildly. Mm-hmm. You know, when somebody says thank you, when they thank the Lord for a safe night for the, that, they've been, that they've come through the night, they're thankful that they still have a coffee cup in the morning that hasn't been shot up during the night. Mm. So the levels of violence are, are high. Um, people do despair, and and hope is 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 waning. There's there's a lack of confidence in the police system, mm-hmm. in the judiciary, and so there's not a lot of collaboration, you know, with the community and the police to to eradicate the problems. You told me the story of one mom and the dilemma that she faced with her son in the midst of this environment. Uh, I, I, it's not a normal pastoral problem. <laughs> so um, t- t- tell a little bit about about that. Yeah, this lady. She's uh, she's a, she's a member of our church, and she's she's faithful. She's been a been a been a faithful Christian for a number of years. Um, she has a young son, fifteen, probably going on going on sixteen. Um, and then she has three older daughters who live with her. All of them have children outside of of marriage. Um, the boyfriends are just gone or dead. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't find any fathers. They mm-hmm. they're either dead or in prison, or they're running with the gangs, mm-hmm. or they run off with somebody else. Mm-hmm. So there's an absence of males. Anyway, the one daughter was cleaning the lounge, uh, cleaning the bathroom the one day, and as she swept, a panel on the side of the bathtub fell loose, and she found two packs of of tablets. Um, there's a drug called Mandrax mm-hmm. that's commonly used. It's smoked with uh, marijuana mm-hmm. and is fairly, fairly available on the streets in the Cape Flats. A very popular drug. Probably the two popular drugs would be methamphetamine mm-hmm. and, and Mandrax. She found two packs of the drugs worth, worth nearly 800,000 rand. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the gangsters had used the youngster to hide it away for them. And so this innocent kid, uh, he was only in grade seven, grade eight. Hmm. He would be the runner. So when they needed something, he'd fetch it. Um, the police would never raid that home. That's a fine lady's home, and mm-hmm. the, the, the kids are not involved with drugs. Anyway, this youngster was running the stuff. So she'd spoken to me about what she should do. And I then consulted with a with some senior policemen about what the avenue would be. Do we turn this over to the police? And the tension would be that if she did, and she was hesitant to do that because she was so afraid that there was corruption within the police system mm-hmm. and the drugs would end up back in the street again mm-hmm. and she'd then be victimized um, for having, having, having done that mm-hmm. and by, the, by the gang. And while I was still consulting with that, um, she actually came to see me and said, Pastor, just leave it. Um, I've actually gone to see the gang leader. I've given him back his drugs and asked him to stay away from my family. And he agreed. He agreed. Hmm. So those are difficult issues to deal with. You mm-hmm. wrestle with the ethics of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but families have to make decisions in order to survive. They don't have the means to get out of the community. Mm-hmm. And, and certainly police protection, there's no such thing. Mm-hmm. So, so what we are, what we've described in this entire podcast is kind of extreme. What I would regard as extreme dysfunction at a at a social level, at just about every possible place that you turn, and um, and what we've seen God do in your life is to actually um, enter in through His grace and mercy. And really give you a life that that probably at one point, if you'd looked at the trajectory of where you were going, would not be expected. <laughs> what has what has been 
yeah, what is what is really abnormal has become normal for Trish and myself, and I'm immensely grateful for for my wife. Um, the role that she plays in in keeping my bits together to mm-hmm. be able to do what I need to do, mm-hmm. and and she has a great deal of of, of gumption in herself. I mean, she mm-hmm. spends a lot of time in the community, mm-hmm. and both of us have found that it's. The only reason why we could do what we do is because we've been given a great amount of grace. Mm -hmm. And the more grace we've been given, the more we ought to be showing to others. Mm. I recognize just the the depth of wickedness of my own heart and how much I've been forgiven. Mm. And therefore, I would forgive others much as well. Mm -hmm. And when we look back on the number of times that the Lord has providentially shown us his care, um, his provision, um, you know, in, in some ways, we, we regularly just e- erect memorial stones each time the Lord has done something amazing for mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. And we look back and remind ourselves of God's grace over a period of time. Mm-hmm. And that's really what motivates us to keep going. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Lord has been faithful in all of these. Um, the number of opportunities we've had to minister to others who have been broken and, and shattered. And it's really just been um, just our, our own experience of God's, God's grace that has enabled us to be able to share and, and encourage others as well. Well, it's a terrific ministry. Uh, we, you know, I had the privilege of actually just sitting in the audience of the, of the, of the church that's in the middle of this Community in which there are there are there are simple homes, and in some of the areas, there's nothing but corrugated um, corrugated steel that makes up the walls and that kind of thing. <laughs> A lot of people have a dish, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, and and to see it, um, you know, I was with you one night when you got a call from someone living across the street from the church in which the last round of major shootings had taken place in your neighborhood and you were wrestling with how to minister to the people in that context. So Neil, I appreciate you taking the time to come all the way over to Dallas. I mean, you you have won the award for the uh, longest distance traveled for anyone that we've interviewed. For the longest swim. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, uh, and share your story and help us to get a glimpse out of out of how um, serious and how pervasive and how structural sometimes racism can be and how the answer to that question is found inside the human heart in the work of God. Absolutely. So we thank you for your testimony. It's been a great privilege. Thank you. Yeah. And we thank you for joining us on the table. We hope you'll be back with us again soon. uh, And uh, thank you for being a part of this podcast. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.